Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Product Con uh, Fireside Chat. My name is Flavia. I'm your moderator today, and I have the pleasure of having here with me today Alexa, who works at Fivetrend as Director of Product, Shailish, who heads product at Sendbird, and Lauren, who is currently leading product growth at Mural. I will briefly introduce myself. I will, uh, and then I will hand it over to you guys so that everybody can hear firsthand what you guys have been up to. And uh, so I'll start. So as I said, my name is Flavia. I'm currently director of product at Spotify. I've worked in organizations of different sizes in different industries. I have my fair share of failures to, uh, to share, and but I absolutely love what I do. So I have been working in the experience mission. So we handled the uh, whole mobile uh, experience at Spotify. And before that, I worked at uh, Freenow, a ride hailing uh, company, and then a bunch of different startups. So um, let's start with you, Alexa. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm Alexa. I'm the director of product at Fivetran, and I work on our core experience. So really anything that a customer interacts with in our app. Uh, and um, I've been at Fivetran for about three years, and I've worked at a couple other companies, including Pandora. So we've got some music background to talk about. <laughs> uh, so excited to chat about, about leadership today. Shailesh. Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shailesh Nalawani. I'm the head of product here at Sandbird. Um, Sandbird actually is a developer-focused company that builds, uh, that offers a series of APIs for that enable our customers to incorporate chat, voice, and video into their mobile and web app experience. Um, I, you know, joined uh, Sandbird after a long stint at, at Google in product management um, and a stint kind of running my own startup. So both of those, uh, you know, I have strong influences on kind of my philosophy of leadership. I'm happy to talk about how that uh, came to be. And uh, overall, just, uh, you know, I'm really happy to be here to share some of my learnings. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yes. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Lauren Schumann. I'm the VP of product growth at Mural. If you're not familiar with Mural, we are a digital collaboration tool for the virtual collaboration space. So very busy right now with all the remote work that's going on. I've been with Mural for a little over six months, and my responsibility is really around driving growth for the company. And that's mostly through our self-service business via the product. So our team's a little bit different than a lot of core or traditional product teams in that we don't really focus on building features and functionality, but more on driving uh, business outcomes for the company. So things that we would work on would be related to, say, key parts of the customer journey, such as like sign up, activation, conversion, engagement, things like that. Before I joined Mural, I was in a similar role at MailChimp for about four years. And um, I really, I care a lot about leadership. I, I put a lot of time into reading and investing into it, failing and hopefully succeeding too. So I'm very excited to talk a little bit more about that today. Thank you so much. MailChimp is in the news today. Yes, a <laughs> big day yesterday. I've been chatting with a lot of my uh, former coworkers about the, uh, the big news. Yeah. All right, so I'm I'm super excited about this conversation because um, I think there's there isn't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of conversations about leadership from a from a failure perspective and how we learn and how difficult it is. It, it's usually wrapped around in uh, it's amazing, we just grow and then we make decision decisions and it's all about making decisions and then everybody forgets that there is a very difficult part of leading people and leading an organization that usually doesn't uh, get uh, exposed to aspiring leaders. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today and what we want to uh, kind of pass on to you today is Share some of, our, some of our stories, some of our failures, learnings, things that we learned the hard way, things that uh, we actually succeeded in, and we found our way around the difficult situations, and then hopefully inspire everybody to, um, to become leaders, or if you're already in a leadership position, uh, hopefully help with some potential challenges that you're going to have uh, ahead of you. So without uh, any further ado, let's start this conversation, and I'm going to start by asking you guys... Um, if you plan to become leaders or if it just happened, it was by happenstance. Uh, Alexa, maybe? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I'd been a product manager for about five years and I had been our first product manager at Fivetran. Um, so I've been kind of doing a little bit of everything and, and taking over different pieces of, of our product experience. And um, I, I think around year two of being at Fivetran, I realized that I was, you know, either going to need to get a little bit of change on the subject matter or in terms of my role, get some change to to kind of uh, grow in a different way. And so I really intentionally made the decision to go down a management path uh, just to kind of increase the the longevity of my time at Fivetran and increase my my learnings and, and engagement in a different way. Yeah, that's awesome. I I, th- I I really like when people say that, no, it was intentional. I really wanted this for a specific reason because I wanted to grow or influence or what you just said, like ex- extend my my lifetime at, at Five Trend. Uh, Shailish, um, I think you also intentionally went down this path, right? Uh, so there, there's, I think, a couple of inflection points that led me down to, um, you know, management and, and kind of leadership. One uh, was um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the time that I spent do, doing the startup. So I, you know, I, I joined uh, at Google. I worked there for many years. And then, um, you know, like many um, aspiring and ambitious PMs, I'd said, you know, like, I know how to do this. I'm going to go off and actually like, build a company. And that is is not just about building an amazing product that customers love and adopt. It's actually the there's a whole layer of leadership that comes with that. So that was almost a little unintentional where I got thrust into uh, thinking a lot about the leadership aspect, even though it ultimately was a it grew to be a small startup, you know, and never grew to be more than 20 people. But a lot of what, um, you know, was, was led that experience to be positive, uh, you know, was the time that I spent doing uh, leadership. So it was a little unintentional. However, at the end of that uh, period, um, some of the folks that I worked with went on to develop really strong interest in product management and have their own great careers. And they would come back and tell me about some of the conversations that we had had. And I started to realize that uh, the mentoring aspect of what I had done during that time uh, gave me great pride and pleasure. And that uh, led me to realize that actually I was starting to enjoy that aspect. And, and, and you know, that is one of the things that we, that we have the privilege of doing as leaders is mentoring and really guiding junior uh, folks who uh, are earlier in their career. And so then I, I, you know, I began to accept that this was something that I was actually enjoying uh, and, and I started to do it more intentionally after that. That resonates a lot with me. I think it, it wasn't the, sa- the exact same thing for me. It was more the realization that this is not done correctly. Um, and so I, I have this need of I'm going to go and fix something that I know it's fundamentally broken. And at the same time, seeing people that were actually really good, but the leadership team was just not seeing that diamond in the rough. And so this need of, let me just, if I match this skill set, this person with that person, it would be like a really good combination. And so just, and at the same time, sometimes just, encouraging them to to see that the one thing that they do really well or that they care so much about but they just don't see it and when you tell them and when when you coach them in that direction they just like bloom and it's so so incredible so yeah it resonates a lot with me lauren they did happen by happens happenstance or um you also intentionally went into the management path i'd say a little bit of both um when i reflect back on myself I think I just sort of naturally have put myself into leadership positions. And I'm going back to like high school playing sports. Like I'm the kind of person that just sort of was like naturally wanted to step up, help others, like coach, mentor. And I found that people would come to me for things, even just like, hey, can you help me figure out this math problem? And that that kind of continued on into my career. A lot of it was just like not saying no to opportunities. So I remember my first opportunity to lead was really like, hey, there's this problem area that nobody's leading and we need somebody to step up and figure out how to do it. And so I found myself being given those opportunities or having created them, I suppose, from some of my natural tendencies. And as soon as I sort of got a taste of being more formally 
a leader and manager, I really, really leaned into that path and realized that I think it was aligned with my sort of my greater purpose, things that I really enjoy and skill sets that I had. So a little bit of both, I'd say. Interesting. That's so interesting. Um, Shailesh, I, I'm going to uh, kind of go back to what you were saying. Um, you were talking uh, about coaching people and the whole mentorship side of the, the leadership position. Another part of the our job is to actually uh, lead the way, especially on product product growth. I think there's a lot of the vision, the future, how do we uh, anticipate needs and then help people go from today to that future that we want to achieve. And so I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how important the strategy is for you to become an effective leader. So do you, do you think that it, it influences who you are as a leader, what you can achieve, how you inspire your, your team, or do you think that you can do your job regardless of whatever strategy there is in, in the company? So uh, I, I do think strategy is important. Um, it is, um, you know, it, in different circumstances, it's called different things. I'd say one example is calling it a North Star. And it just helps to know the general direction in which we want to go as a company. You know, a very common one, for example, is, you know, are we going up market and serving larger companies? Are we going down market and, you know, serving lots of really small companies? It makes a big difference. So uh, I, I do think it's important to clarify uh, what is the general product direction of the company and how that is derived from the overall uh, direction of the company and what, you know, the top level goals are. Um, again, just referencing my time at Google, um, I'm a big fan of the OKR process and especially the kind of the cascading OKR process because you can use that, that to a certain degree to really talk about how the high level goals influence the, the next level goals and how that translates into the individual product manager and what he or she is working on for the next six months. So, um, so yes, strategy is important. It I think helps, helps set the general roadmap. And then there are then variations of that, which is like, are you working on the most important thing or are you working on something that's peripheral to the strategy? But overall, just knowing what the strategy is and how the direct line from there to the products that we're building is a really good starting point. That, that's, that's interesting. That kind of makes me think about the whole prioritization and how do we prioritize the work, et cetera. Do you have a, a preferred product prioritization framework that you recommend? Um, I'd say in general, most of them, most of the frameworks that exist out there are good if they are applied consistently. Uh, in, in my case and my current situation, we follow a variation of the value versus effort, um, uh, you know, where we, uh, we score the impact of a set of features, you know, uh, and the impact is being associated with our revenue goals, uh, with our customer satisfaction goals. And then we have a similar kind of uh, scoring effort for um, for, for the efforts uh, required to achieve this. And then using some combination of the two, uh, you know, we arrive at a, you know, at a ranked list of things that we'd work on. I'd also say that uh, my team um, in, uh, at, at Sendbird has a lot of folks that have recently transitioned from a very technical role into a product management role. So it was important for me to pick a prioritization that was intuitively easy to understand uh, versus some of the really more, um, you know, uh, fancy ones where it, it gets, you know, much more interesting, where I think having a perspective and an experience would allow you to contextualize them. So this one we picked uh, a little bit intentionally uh, because it was relatively easy to understand. And it was something that we could explain to our colleagues. While you were saying that, I just, it, it just popped in my head that sometimes what we want to do or what we find is right is not necessarily supported by the other leadership functions in, in the business. And so I was thinking, Alexa, I mean, you, you've moved to from an IC to a, a leadership position a long time ago, but um, do you remember when you moved to a leadership position, um, kind of struggling with what do I do now? Like all the things that I saw as an IC, as a, an individual contributor, that I want to fix now. I thought it was just getting the title and now I'm going to make these changes, but I actually have a whole new set of uh, people to influence, discussions that you were not, maybe you were not privy to before. And then suddenly you're like, what do I do now? Or was it a smooth transition because 
the company was well organized. There was a, a prioritization framework, like uh, Shilas was was uh, mentioning, etc. Yeah, well, I, I will correct you in saying I, I moved to leadership a long time ago. I moved to leadership uh, like a year ago, so I'm brand new to all of this um, and uh, definitely have a lot of memory of this. Um, I think that like going back to Shailesh's point, uh, having a clear strategy does mitigate a lot of these the problems that happen. Um, so getting alignment around what are we doing uh, is, is actually super, super helpful. And Fivetran has a, a mix of super alignment and um, a lot of chaos. Uh, I joined probably at like 70 employees and now we're, in, we're now 650. So that hyper growth is really hard to manage and definitely not smooth all the time. Although I do think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, but the I do I do think that moving into management was a combination of both smooth and complex. <laughs> like a lot more of my time is spent building alignment and building um, uh, a vision that people can anchor to to get to that alignment state, to get to that centralized strategy uh, in a way that is different as from being an IC. When in being an IC, I spent a lot of time just executing. Um, and uh, a combination of both, I think, moving from IC to manager and just the company growing at the same time. Um, I, I think as an IC, I had a lot of opportunity to be a part of the strategic conversation. So that enabled the move to be a lot more smooth for me because I already knew who I needed to influence, kind of what people cared about, a little bit of the context. I already had those relationships. And so um, getting to an outcome of strategic alignment, both as an IC and as a manager now, um, has been a lot easier because of that context. And so one thing that I think is really important for ICs who are thinking about becoming managers is getting a seat at the table uh, and really being able to be a part of the conversation as an IC, because it will set you up to when you make that move to actually be able to have the context and have the voice and, and be prepared to, to be a part of that discussion in a way that um, will help it to be a little bit more smooth. Yeah, and, and also um, kind of knowing what they're getting themselves into, which sounds very negative, but truth is when we get into these positions, there's, you know, there's the moment of happiness. I just got this promotion and it's wonderful. And I've always wanted to know what was going on and make the decisions, but suddenly you, you are hit with all of these things that you have to do and, and lead people and you have, you feel a lot of responsibility. So it's also, it's also that, but, but yeah, it resonates a lot with me because uh, having, I had experience where I was just, I got the role, I'm there. Now I need to, to kind of influence all those people. And I don't really know the context because it's my, it's this leadership role in this company. And I had other experiences where I was an IC, I was promoted. I already knew what was going on. So the moment that I got that uh, position that sit at the table, I was actually, I knew what was going on. I knew what needed to be done. So yeah, it uh, makes a lot of sense. And then I was in terms of um, like having that voice sit at the table, setting direction, uh, Lauren, there are a lot of competitors in your space at the moment, right? There's because of the uh, of, of COVID and people starting to, to, to work more remotely, there, there are many new apps and, and tools to, to help collaborate remotely. How much and when do you look outside for outside of your organization to inspire your decisions um, or when you're like blocking everything and just going your way? Yeah, uh, fast growing space for sure. Um, I think that is a balance. Uh, one of the things that I learned from my time at Amazon that I really appreciated was sort of the idea of if you're just copying the competition or paying attention to them, then you are not serving and delighting your, your customers or your users. And I think that there's a healthy balance of understanding what's out in the market and I, competitors also can be seen as just sort of directly similar solutions or products, but you actually think more broadly than that. Like 
it could be something that's really not obvious, like a physical form of something, or, you know, for example, with Zoom, it's not necessarily another video platform, it's like an in-person meeting. So I think understanding really your market and the context and the broader category in which you sort of play is really important. And being mindful of what's happening in the competition, of course, because that is influencing decision making for, you know, for customers. But at the same time, I think the most important thing is being really laser focused on what the specific problems are for users. And I love the jobs to be done framework for that reason, because I think it really boils down into some more specific sort of tactical and actionable ways of understanding what users need and how you can deliver upon those promises. So it's definitely a balance. Uh, you can find yourself getting really too far into, oh my gosh, the competition just did this. I mean, this week alone, there were other competitors that launched new products. And if every time you know, our focus was on how are we going to competitively respond, we're missing the point, which is how can we continue to make Mural the right choice, the right solution for the broader needs and really staying focused on that. Yeah, and and have you ever at Mural or elsewhere had a situation where uh, either it's clear to you, but it's not clear to anybody else, or you have a situation where uh, there is a clear direction from the company that you haven't necessarily bought into yet, but then you have to lead your team. So either in a situation where you're the only person who sees the light at the end of the tunnel, but you still have to bring everybody along with you uh, on this journey, or uh, the other part of uh, maybe they are convinced about, uh, maybe your leadership team, your, your peers are convinced about something you haven't bought into it, but it's like the disagree and commit, you have to do it and you have to lead your team. Do you have any like recommendations on how to approach these situations where you just, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I've been in both scenarios where, uh, I think I've had to disagree and commit. And then also, I think very commonly, especially in being a, in a field like product-led growth, which is like pretty new, there's a lot of education and evangelization. So in a lot of my past roles, it was about teaching people and then also convincing them to invest uh, in something brand new. So it wasn't just, hey, here's this thing and people don't agree. There was an element of, here's what this thing is. Here's why it's important getting the leeway and the budget to even try something new to be able to prove out sort of a use case uh, for it. And so I guess the advice in that scenario, because that's very familiar to me, is start small. Don't try to, you know, craft the entire discipline and practice and make it perfect. I think I've made mistakes in trying to either scale too quickly or make sure it's done right versus done in the way that the organization can support. So an example of that is like leaning into where you already have momentum, even if it's not precisely what you're trying to accomplish. So an example of this at MailChimp was I was building out both our growth practice and experimentation. So AB testing program, and people kept sort of using those synonymously and saying like, this is the experimentation team, but we were actually trying to use experimentation to drive growth. And for the team, our small team, it would drive people crazy and say, like, we're not just the experimentation team. We actually are experimenting, you know, to drive activation. And there's like specifics behind it. And what I learned is that the company was more ready to talk about things like experimentation. And there were ways that we could actually lean into that conversation, open the door, have a conversation, get people to, you know, use tools like A-B testing and then explain sort of how this could evolve into, you know, driving product-led growth in other ways. So it's a start small, be scrappy, you know, wear lots of hats, uh, lean into where you have momentum and don't just constantly try to fight, you know, the good fight against maybe where you don't have momentum. And then for me in those scenarios, it really just took sort of like that aha moment of, seeing the value in this small scale effort to get leadership bought in and timing was key, right? Like I could not have predicted when that was going to happen, but the persistence of the teaching evangelizing over time paid off because when they were ready, we were there and the, the, the concepts were there. So 
um, those are some of my sort of key advice on that one, the, the one part of the, uh, you know, getting people to be bought into something new. I second everything that you said. It reminds me so much of so many mistakes that I made in my last company where it was exactly that. Not I wanted things done it in a different way, in the perceived perfect way. And so I was just like going against um, stakeholders who the majority of them had never worked in a tech environment. They came from consulting, from uh, from uh, banking industry. So they they didn't really know how tech products were built. And instead of using that or leveraging that momentum that you were talking about, I was just like, no, this has to be done this way. And it was just so much harder. And then when that momentum existed, it was just smooth sailing. They were already convinced. It was just like, okay, I'm going to go this way. You're you're already bought into it. And then I'm going to prove you that this is the right way. And once you see it, you get convinced. And so once we went through this process, they would not need to be convinced because they were already open to that. They saw the benefit of working that way uh, versus the preview, what they wanted or what they were used to. And then it was just much easier to convince them. Um, Not convince them, but bring them along uh, on the journey. Um, And that reminds me of something else, uh, Shailish, which is every time I talk about big changes that I made in, in, in previous companies that I worked for, I usually get the same question, which I think Lauren kind of already uh, touched on uh, with her uh, three points that everybody should focus on. But I'm thinking that a lot of times you have you have tons of stakeholders from multiple disciplines. If you work in a company with different markets or operations, you have conflicting asks. Everybody wants their stuff done. How do you deal with with conflicting requests with lots of stakeholders pushing for different topics at the same time with everything is urgent and very important. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things uh, you will do in, a, in an organization, particularly when you're experiencing hyper growth. So, you know, like uh, Mural uh, and Lauren alluded to for Mural and even in Fitran, there's always, always going to be more things that, you know, you have to do than there are people. And no, it's not always a matter of like, oh, if only we had 20% more headcount, like we would get these things done. Often actually, the, the, the it is maybe the wrong thing to do. And the lazy thing to do is to just say, oh, we just you know, get more headcount and you know, we'll address the issues. But the harder thing is to say, no, that actually this is not aligned uh, in, in the rank list of things that, you know, we have, we can, these are, there are 11 things we can work on, but we only have time to do five. And which of those five and, and why those five and how do you convince everyone uh, that it's those five and not the other six is what makes, uh, you know, product management and particularly leadership within PM, you know, so difficult. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, certainly hard enough and you have to deal with stakeholders that are used to working with you, such as engineering and, and maybe your product marketing colleagues. And then when you throw in uh, folks uh, that you know, have a heterogeneous background, maybe come from, as you said, consulting, um, you know, operations, business development, um, you know, some of the most interesting conversations tend to be, BD comes in and says, we could do this one partnership and it would, you know, open up our uh, our pipeline like so. And, and you're like, well, it's just, you know, just a simple partnership, but then there's a lot of implied you know, integrations behind it. Um, it's hard. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it, I think it comes down to you as a, in a leadership role within product management explaining the how how you build products the timelines uh and and the different stakeholders and the different priorities one good tool in this is if you have a sense of a product roadmap that you already have built out and you can use that as the starting point of any discussion about any new initiatives that you want to add saying like this is what we've committed to uh we're not wedded to this it's not a fixed thing that you know that cannot change but it the change happens within the context of an existing roadmap what should we stop doing to fund this new effort? Uh, and I think just clarifying it in that way, you know, uh, it's frustrating for colleagues in, in consulting who come in and we're like, well, you're always you know, making this much harder because it is actually much harder. There is an existing set of things that we've committed to. And for us to do something, um, it would have to be measurably more impactful on our overall goals uh, or you know, our, our, the prioritization framework compared to what's already on there. 
Um, so having that conversation, you know, not saying like yes or no, but saying in the context of an existing roadmap and an existing strategy, how does this fit and why do you think it's better? And, and engaging in a, in a you know, Q&A with the stakeholders, I think, um, starts to build in their mind some of the appreciation for the complexity of, of managing roadmaps and execution. Yeah, yeah, I second that as well. Um, we're almost uh, on time, so I have one final question for um, for all of you. Um, that is kind of inspiring new leaders that are have stepped into the leadership uh, path recently, or yeah, recently. So, what's your number one advice on how to increase teams' performance? Uh, without doing so at the expense of their sanity health. Uh, because lately, at least I have been hearing a lot about burnout and people are in a really bad mental state because a lot of people are still at home and there's the, there's no uh, normalcy is not back. And so how do you increase performance without uh, burning people out? Uh, Alexa? Sure, yeah, I think... There's a combination of things that we're focused on at Fivetran right now. Um, we have a really generous vacation policy and we are really encouraging our team to take time off, even though maybe they're not going to somewhere exciting. Um, so that's one big piece is, you know, folks are working all of the time now that we're in this world that we live in. <laughs> and uh, uh just encouraging. Um, so I actually monitor folks on my team in the time that they're taking and, and make sure that they're, that they're getting the adequate encouragement. We also have folks um, post when they're taking vacation and post photos when they're, they're back. Uh, so that folks are really excited and encouraged uh, just from a, a cultural perspective to, to be a part of that. Um, and the other piece is just empowerment. I think that um, one of my big pieces of, of philosophy in, in moving into this, this role is I want to create an opportunity for folks to have ownership and, and really drive results themselves. And so um, really having strong uh, targets that you, that you need to achieve, a clear mission, um, and, and then the leeway to get all of those things done is, the, is a big piece of what I think is a really encouraging people um, right now to, to, to do their best at Fivetran. I'm, I'm so, I, we don't have time, but I'm so going to comment that it's interesting because I've been talking a lot about uh, pushing people too much and asking them to work to, to work too hard and I, I and then that associated with their their uh, not motivated they're losing their motivation in the company etc and i actually find and i've seen this happen uh through transitions that i made in previous companies like transformation um transformational uh, processes within the teams that uh, sometimes it's not really the hard work. It's actually not having clear goals, not feeling ownership and the, the, the sense that I contributed to this. There is meaning to my work. I feel that that has, takes a, a bigger toll on people's mental health rather than actually working really hard. Because sometimes I have people that I have to tell them, go home, stop working, enough is enough, there's, tomorrow is another day, no, nobody's going to die, and they're like, no, but I really want to do this, I'm so excited, I don't want to stop, I, I just want to keep going, and so I think that that is really interesting what you said about empowering people and, and making them feel that they're part of this, and that their work matters, and that there is a reason why we're doing this, and something that we're going to accomplish together, um, that not only increases performance, I think, but also not at the expense, and also increases uh, mental stability, health, et cetera. Anyway, uh, Lauren, do you have an advice for uh, new leaders? Yeah, you all had covered uh, a lot of it on that topic, but I would add a couple of things uh, related to, I guess, team health is, yes, I agree wholeheartedly that having really clear strategy with goals and how they ladder up is, is very important. There's nothing more demotivating than thinking like, I don't know if my work matters or why I'm doing this or how it all connects, especially in a really fast growing company like Mural, that's very motivating to see how 
you connect to the to the broader picture. But I would also say like on a day to day, we have to celebrate wins, even if they're little wins that can be very encouraging to people and creating that in your culture so that you're constantly celebrating each other. And then one philosophy I have of my from my leadership is just like be very open and transparent and real, like acknowledge when things suck. If there if something is not going well or people are really struggling, I don't think it does anybody any favors to try to pretend that <laughs> things are great when they're not. One of the tactics that we use for some of our ongoing meetings with my direct reports is even just starting our meeting with how are you showing up today? So I got really sick of the question of how are you because I found that nobody was answering it. It was just like, I'm fine. And what is pandemic fine versus other fine? It wasn't giving a lot of information. But how you're showing up today really pivoted the conversation into people talking about either professional and personal work. And it was like very specific to that day. So I'm showing up as a four today because I'm really having problems with X, Y, and Z. But at home, this great thing is happening. And I think it really brought out some of the humanness in everybody and gave some context to, you know, how we were working together. So I think that transparency, that openness in the communication was really important. And that's how I sort of measured team health a little bit and got a pulse on it on a regular basis. And then also just making time to have fun together. That's also been really interesting in a remote world. The things that were in my playbook are like, yeah, I can't do any of those. I'm this, this global fully remote company in a pandemic. So getting creative about how to have fun. We did an event a few weeks ago with like, we brought in a virtual comedy tour and we just laughed together. And I kind of forgot the power of laughing. I don't know how, I mean, it makes a ton of sense, but the power of the bonding over laughing and what that can do for just like your mental state and how you show up for sort of the next thing. So making time, I think for all of that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And also a, a little bit of vulnerability from, from leaders as well. I find that if I open up to my team and I say, you know what, I'm having a really bad day and these are the reasons why, I think it also gives them space to feel that it's okay to not feel okay for a few days and it doesn't, the world doesn't end there. So seeing these ups and downs of, of leaders and feeling that, oh, they're also human beings. So this, this is okay that I feel like this and, and the laughter as well. I, I had, um, I joined Spotify remotely, so I did not meet anybody um, in person before. And I totally, I was so cocky when people asked me, are you sure you want to do that? Like, are you really joining a company remotely? And I'm like, ah, oh, I've managed teams remotely all my life. It was so easy. It's going to be fine. I was in the West working with people in, in Europe, the other way around. And then I joined the company remotely and I'm like, what the hell did I do? I don't know anybody. I don't have anybody to vent. I don't have anybody to lean on. It's just, I don't understand anything. This organization is huge. I have to schedule uh, meetings with people to ask them simple questions like, what does DRM mean? I don't know. I've been reading this everywhere. So anyway, sorry, sorry I'm completely deviating. Shailish. <laughs> uh, actually, for... Uh... What I want to do actually was to re-emphasize the role of vulnerability in leadership. Um, I know you talked about it and um, and I actually want to reiterate it because it has been uh, something that I've um, really come to rely on and because it has really helped me uh, be much more transparent and much more open. And as a consequence has encouraged uh, other folks on my team to also open up. Um, there's a couple of nuances to that. One, uh, in, in my case, you know, we, uh, in the case of Sandbird, we have uh, a set of colleagues that are based out of APAC, uh, Korea specifically, and then um, in a group that's based out of San Mateo. So cultural differences in, in how you uh, encourage vulnerability and how vulnerability in the workplace is perceived are, are quite significant. Um, but it, regardless of culture, um, having the permission to talk about the difficulties you're having, I think is very important and healthy for an organization, right? I think as leaders, we recognize now more than ever that the person that you're working with isn't just, you know, for those eight hours that you're with them and they're in the office, there's a whole another aspect of them outside that, you know, they could be doing great at work, but that could be really dragging down their spirits. So I really like that question, Lauren, that you asked, because it acknowledges that there, that there is, you know, a 360 degree 
person here, uh, you know, at work and at home. Um, and, um, and, and I know you've mentioned this, Flavia, but really using one, an opportunity to talk about the difficulties that you're having. I think setting the example that it's okay to discuss the difficulties and, and encouraging others to do so, whether in group settings or in one-on-one, -on -one, I think is, is really important. Um, you know, in addition to all the great advice, I think just acknowledging that, that there's so much stress and, and that people sometimes just need someone to talk to um, and uh, or actually just have someone listen to them, uh, I think would be, is, is important for us as leaders to know. Yeah, I, I, I think that companies are changing and are caring a lot more about uh, being human uh, and, and empathizing with people, with the, the teams. Right. And I think that somewhere in this, in the initial process, it was done for, uh, with the goal of increasing companies' uh, bottom line. But I think now people are starting to realize that it's so much more than that. It's about human beings. It's about, yes, you we will get the results more often than not. It, it will come naturally, but it's actually caring about people. And I feel very happy with that because um, I think that we, at least in Europe, I'll speak for Europe, um, for the longest time, it was just about the bottom line. It, it was just about profits and not really the, the, the teams. And I think, I think that now it's, 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 it has changed a lot. I need to wrap this up. I, uh, I hope you had as much fun as I did. This was awesome for me. I hope people at home also uh, took some interesting stories and advice from very seasoned uh, leaders that, uh, that joined me today. I hope you had fun. And thank you so much, guys, for being here today. Thanks, Flavia. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, thank you.